Good Monday morning. As we kick off earnings season this week, we have 30 minutes until the start of trading today. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Bassett. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Bloomberg Open Interest starts right now. And coming up, the fallout from Friday's blowout jobs report is forcing traders to recalibrate expectations. That's all while tensions in the Middle East continue. As Wall Street firms get set to kick off earnings season, we'll take stock of the tense competition between banks and private credit lenders. Plus, Pfizer on the rise. Activist investor Starboard takes a $1 billion stake in the pharma giant trying to turn a spur around. We'll get into all that and more, but let's take a look at where markets are trading because we have an interesting pre-bell trade on our hands. You can see stocks down. We had a big roaring finish to Friday after that jobs report that we got, but now the tables have turned markets theoretically deciding that was bad news. And part of the reason why is you take a look at what's going on in the bond market. Ten-year yields now above 4%, continuing to rise today to the tune of six basis points. That has some fears out there, Matt, that maybe this Fed won't actually have to cut at all in November. Yeah, because the jobs number proved that all systems are go. On the other hand, we're looking at a yield curve that briefly re-inverted this morning. Does that mean a recession is yet to come. Despite all these moves, that doesn't stop a merger Monday. We are looking at some stocks here. Activist investor Starboard Value reportedly now has nearly a billion dollar stake in Pfizer. They're betting on a turnaround plan from the drug maker that has invested billions in M&A. Pfizer now up pre-market almost 3%. Also watching shares of Arcadium Lithium PLC here up almost 36%. It was approached by Rio Tinto and what could be another merger in the mining industry. We'll keep an eye on that. We're also watching Barnes Group agreeing to be taken public by Apollo, which will acquire the tech and space manufacturer for an all cash deal, valuing the company at $3.6 billion. Barnes now up 2.5%. Also interested in Duckhorn, wine in the morning. The Napa Valley winemaker will also be taken private by Butterfly. For nearly $2 billion, a hefty premium for a wine company worth less than a billion dollars in public markets today, Matt. All right, so a lot going on in stocks uh, today. And to me, it seems like we have a little bit of delayed reaction in this market. Remember um, last month on September 18th when the Fed cut by 50 basis points and the market actually fell. The S&P closed the day down. Of course, the next trading day, we were up 1.7%. When you sent me the jobs number on Friday mm -hmm. at 8.30 a.m., I was off that day, um, I thought, wow, that means the Fed's not going to cut, so the market must tank. In fact, the S&P closed higher on Friday. Nine-tenths of a percent But futures higher. are down today. Yes, they are. I just want to talk about what an emotional market this is with such a short memory, because you remember August 2nd, we got a very weak jobs report that spurred a chorus of calls for an emergency Fed rate cut. Now you fast forward two months, we got a a stronger than expected jobs report. I wouldn't go and call that a blowout necessarily. Suddenly you have traders scrapping rate cut bets altogether left and right and raising the very real question in the market right now, does the Fed go at all in November? Yeah, less than a quarter point rate cut baked into the market right now to the point that you're making. But also what I'm interested in, yes, the stock market reversal, we're seeing it today. What we're seeing, though, is an extension of the move in the bond market that we saw on Friday. So my question is, when does the bond market start to impact the stock market? Perhaps this is the start of a trend. I think we're seeing it today. If it sticks, right? If You're it already sticks. thinking about banks on Friday. Well, the <laughs> yield curve inversion would matter yeah. to the banks. It means they would make less money. But if rates stay higher, it also could mean they make more net interest income. All right, let's talk about all of this and more with Seema Shah, Chief Global Strategist at Principal Asset Management. Seema, I think the question of the day really is... Um, um, is it better for stocks to have a healthier economy than we expected, but fewer rate cuts, or to have more rate cuts and a pronounced economic slowdown? Uh, to me, this is, this is a sweet spot. This is a great environment for equities. You've got a strong economy. It's slowing, I still think, but it's strong. And you've got a Fed who is still willing to cut rates. We, we still think there's a 25 basis point cut in November and December, uh, probably slower move through 2025, but it's still a rate cutting cycle backed up by a strong economy. This is, I think this is a great environment. So slowing, but still strong. And against that backdrop, 
how do you make heads or tails or what's, of what's going on today? You see S&P 500 futures down about half a percent, of course, not to extrapolate too much on a single day, but it does seem like the market is taking this good news as bad news. I mean, you said it before, it's a really dramatic equity market. You've seen that for a couple of months where it just, you know, the, the kind of the moves are pretty wild. And I think today there are question marks about whether or not the Fed is going to cut. Uh, if it didn't cut, that would certainly be, I think, negative news for the equity market. But we don't think that's the case. I think this is, we're going to hear a lot from Fed speakers this week, uh, provided the inflation report doesn't show a, a significant pickup inflation. I mean, that's a big question. But provided it's in line with expectations, and I think uh, you're going to see an equity market which hopefully settles down and we start to move back upwards. You know, I think about some writing over the weekend from Stuart Kaiser, who we're talking to later in the show, and the point that he made was you could actually see a bounce heading into the election season. Do you think that in the rest of October, given what a strong September we had, there are more room for gains, especially as we start to get those earnings releases? How much upside I potential is yeah, there? Yeah, I think there is upside. And as you said, look, this is unusual because in into, an equity market, into an election, you would typically expect to see some volatility, some concerns. But you've got a global economy which has got a ton of stimulus coming through. We're not just talking about, of course, the US, but you're seeing it around the world, including China. Uh, so, no, I think that there is room for a melt up into November. The only thing which is restricting it is the fact that valuations are really extended. So I don't think you're going to see the same kind of moves you saw in 2023 or early 24. But certainly this is an upward move for the equity market. Are valuations extended everywhere or is it still just the MAG-7? I note that we're going to talk to um, Natalia Knijevich a little bit later, and she's going to tell us that funds have exited their MAG-7 positions, or at least they got out of some of them last week. Is it better to get into you know, the S&P 493? Oh, it is. This is, um, you know, we've seen the big tech trade do well, and we certainly we look, we believe in it from a long-term perspective, so it's a strategic asset allocation positioning for us. But if you have a solid economic backdrop coupled mm. up with Fed cuts, it makes sense to look at where else in the market there is a better valuation, which has got a little bit more room for gains. So at this point in time, we're looking outside of the MAG-7, uh, different sectors, different cap sizes, and thinking where are the tactical trades. The question of whether it's extended beyond over the next six months, I think, is a bigger one because we still have to see how the market, I mean, the economy responds. Uh, but certainly over the next six months, I think there's a lot of opportunities outside of those max seven. Well, let's talk about, of course, how earnings season factors into that call, that broadening out that you're looking for there. Because we hear all the time that rate cuts alone aren't enough when you think of particularly some of the smaller companies in the market struggling under those debt burdens. When you look ahead to the earnings season that kicks off on Friday, of course, with the big banks, but looking beyond that, are you expecting to see results, fundamentals that justify the valuations? I think we should see some fairly positive numbers. Um, I think expectations, as you'd expect, are starting to come down ahead of the earnings season as, as exactly what you'd, you'd typically see. But I think the rate cutting cycle, it is still an important part of that, that story because there is some margin pressure, especially amongst some of the smaller businesses. Those rate cuts will be an additional help as you continue to see those um, you know, concerns around labor costs, maybe some job uncertainty. Those things are weighing on confidence and rate cuts certainly help. Uh, I don't think we're looking at a bumper season, uh, but this is enough at least, particularly when valuations for some of them are so cheap that you could see that push higher. What sectors do you like going into earnings? Of course, we start with the big banks, but it's a long season ahead and a lot of it before that election season. Yeah, absolutely. So we like financials, we like industrials. I think there's a lot of opportunities in, in there. Broadly speaking, though, wherever you're going, we're still thinking about high quality, right? So it's high quality within your sectors, within your cap sizes. I still think that's key because Fine, we've had a good number on Friday, but the long-term trajectory we still think is a slower economy. So it still makes sense to be focusing on the parts of the market, the companies which do look like they have the, the good cash buffers, um, you know, maybe stronger margins, cash balances that can withstand any kind of uh, risks over the coming months. When you uh, say high quality, I think about um, staying away from the Russell 2000. Uh, I've heard some the investors, well, call it kind of junky. What do you think about the smaller caps? So it's an interesting story, and I think everyone's gone round and round on this one, because typically, like a slower economic environment is not great for small caps. We know that. Um, but we just had some pretty good news on Friday, which we think, you know, as I said, it's a slowing economy, but it's still positive growth. Uh, and then you've got the rate cuts. But on top of that, there's a valuation story, which is really important right now. Valuations had been, I mean, it's moved certainly a, a fair amount over the summer, but valuations had been so, um, so attractive relative to large caps that you just needed a bit of a fundamental push to see the swing. Now, whether or not it's, ex it's extended beyond uh, December, I think is a bigger question, but I certainly think there's a tactical opportunity here for that small cap space. 
I want to talk a little bit about the rest of the world, too. I want to talk specifically about China. Of course, those markets in mainland China, they reopen tomorrow after a week-long holiday. Uh, and you have some people saying that basically all this euphoria that we're seeing, this optimism that we're seeing in the wake of that uh, strong stimulus package, maybe it's looking a little bit overdone. How are you viewing China markets in isolation, but also as they filter through the rest of the world? Right. I think for China, it, it, that's absolutely true. We need to see implementation. We need to see magnitude. And I think we've become accustomed over previous years that you see this wonderful announcement when it comes to implementation. It's really disappointing. So that's always the risk. But I think what we're hearing from policymakers is a real commitment or an acknowledgement that there is an urgency about the situation. And that in itself is positive, which when you couple that up again with cheap valuations, I think it's room for a push. Are you going to see another 20% move in one week? I think that's unlikely because you start to now see action and proof coming through. But I think over the, over the coming months, I think there is still some movement for China and to your, to your next point, how it feeds through to the rest of the world, particularly Asia, so Korea, Taiwan, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, these are all areas that we think we can do well. Uh, Europe, I think, is, a, is probably another story, a different slight question, maybe some upside for some of the luxury brands. Mm. Uh, I think European story is a little bit weaker from a fundamental perspective. But with all that said, where do you put the marginal dollar? If you had to choose between Chinese equities or US equities at the point where valuations look high, right? They look quite stretched in both regions after the run-up you've recently seen. Where does that extra dollar go? It's a great question because, as you said, you know, we can talk about the U.S. market looking really extended, but it's not like it's the only market which is looking expensive. But I still think China has, has still got attractive valuations. It makes sense to, to maybe um, to plug it into some segments of the China market, but also other parts of EM which do stand to benefit. So there are opportunities. I think this is a time for global diversification particularly when you remember that there's a U.S. election on the way, uh, there's a Middle East conflict, having all your eggs in one basket is probably not your, your wisest decision. All right, Seema, hold that thought. You're sticking with us. Let's take a quick check on the markets right now. With about 20 minutes until the bells ring, you can see red on the screen all the way down the S&P 500 off three-tenths of a percent. Same thing, too, if you take a look at the NASDAQ 100 and the Russell 2000, of course, the bond market starting to make itself known to the equity market as traders shred up those rate cut bets. Let's get a look at the stocks moving underneath the surface. We're going to do that with Abigail Doolittle. Well, with U.S. futures down, as you're pointing out, in the pre-market here, Katie. Let's take a look at some of the biggest point drags, including Apple, which of course is one of the biggest point contributors to the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. We do have Jefferies downgrading shares to a hold from a buy, saying that excitement and optimism around the iPhone 16, well, it's overdone, especially as it has to do with AI. Turning to another big point contributor to the big indexes, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, we do have Amazon down 1.3%. I should note both of these stocks off their lows. This has to do with another downgrade, Wells Fargo cutting shares to an equal weight from an overweight, so essentially, uh, again, a hold from a buy. This ahead of the all-important Prime Day, which starts tomorrow. The analyst over at Wells Fargo thinks that there's lots of headwinds, including that AWS, uh, their cloud unit, it's just cannot all rely on cloud. And then finally, let's end on a bright note here, Shanali. We do have the shares of Wynn popping higher up 2.2%. The initial gaming data out of Macau for the golden uh, week, well, it's positive, so that's one boost. And then we also have Wynn receiving a gaming operating license out of the UAE. That is another reason this stock higher because of all the China stimulus and that Macau reliance, Shanali these shares up more than 30% over the last two weeks or so. Abigail, thank you for keeping an eye on what's moving under the hood. Now, coming up, one year has passed since the major escalation between Hamas and Israel. We're going to have the latest next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get out of high interest to look at what's making headlines around the world. Fighting in the Middle East is escalating after Hamas fi fired rockets 
at Israel from Gaza. One year has now passed since the Hamas fighters stormed into southern Israel, setting off the chain of turmoil that has engulfed the region ever since. In Israel, 1,200 people were killed and 250 others were taken hostage. Around 100 remain in Gaza. Of course, that's a year ago. Since then, 42,000 Palestinians have been killed and around 2,000 people have been killed in Lebanon by Israel. Hurricane Milton is intensifying its path towards Florida with the storm expected to reach a category four status. The potential for devastation to Tampa and surrounding areas is already estimated to cause tens of billions of dollars in damage. Milton will be the second major storm to strike Florida in less than two weeks and the fifth hurricane to hit the US this year. And gold bars are flying off the shelves at Costco. As bullion prices hit fresh record highs, a survey of stores across 46 states revealed that the retailer is struggling to keep gold products stocked. Yes, it actually sells gold bars. The one-stop shop has attracted a new cohort of fresh buyers to the precious metal, even as prices continue to climb up around 30% this year alone. Shanali? I'm an Indian person, Matt. I grew up with gold bars in my basement. That is safety if you have ever had it. What's your address? <laughs> <laughs> Keeping that away from you. Anyways, uh, we are back with Principal Asset Management Chief Global Strategist Seema Shah. If you think about last week as a microcosm, you saw the escalation of tensions in the Middle East and you saw a bid in the bond market. We saw a sell off after what we saw from the jobs report. But are bonds a haven here given those tensions, those cross currents you're seeing in the market? I think it is to some extent, right? Now, of course, it's being somewhat dull because there's a whole changing expectations around the Fed. Um, I don't think that 10 years have too much further to go from here. And suddenly, if you were to see a continued escalation uh, where you do see some really meaningful deterioration, then I think that safe haven play comes in. I mean, we, but you just mentioned gold. I mean, that's another one, which I think mm. in this environment, you've got uh, global political tensions and you've got maybe renewed concerns. Some people have renewed concerns about inflation. That is a perfect time for gold. Shanali, I hear what you're saying about that brief bid that we saw, but you take a look at the 10-year Treasury yield. I mean, it's risen three straight weeks in a row by a pretty impressive magnitude, up 22 basis points last week alone. So you mentioned gold, but when it comes to havens, when it comes to hedging this market, I mean, could you just do that through options? Or do you think that uh, there's still value in taking yourself entirely away from the equity market for that hedge? I don't think you want to take yourself away from the equity market. As I said, I think there's a lot of upside to play there. But I think fixed income, particularly core fixed income, has got a really important part to play. You know, I think duration, it, it's not as attractive as, you know, ideally it would have been. But I think it's an important hedge against maybe some downside economic risk and maybe geopolitical tensions. And I think the front end of the curve actually has come up a little bit too much. I think there's question marks around the, if, whether or not the Fed is going to continue to cut rates. I think it will. So that probably means a little bit down, renewed down pressure onto that front end, whereas the long end, because we're still looking at a soft landing, um, maybe has a little bit further to, to, to move up, but, but I don't think it's too much. But you don't think, I mean, when rates started to drop, the idea that money would flow out of money markets into stocks was one that pretty much every strategist was touting. You know, now that we're back at four, it feels like my alarm went off, but it's Saturday, so I'm going to go back to bed, right? Shouldn't I just be attracted back to cash? No, because, and I think this is just about today, because people are saying, right, is the Fed going to continue cutting? I think they will. And if they're cutting, uh, then actually your reinvestment risk of sitting in cash is just growing and growing and growing. This is actually a great opportunity right now, given the sell-off, to get yourself exposure to fixed income, lock in some of these higher yields. Uh, so I think there's a lot of it going on with financial plumbing, which is diverting um, or at least keeping cash in money market funds. But that over time will shift away uh, and we should see that pushing into risk assets, which will be another tailwind. I think another really important trade to talk about is the energy trade at this juncture, just because of the way we have seen commodities move on the heels of escalating conflict and the bid we've seen in the energy sector, even on days where no one wanted to buy stocks. Is that sustainable? I actually think the commodity space, NG, is a really confusing part of the market right now because it's moved in ways that you wouldn't necessarily expect it to. I mean, even in the early moments of the geopolitical crisis, you were not really seeing oil prices rise because of, um, you know, considerations around supply. To me, this is a slightly um, confusing part of the market. I think there's better opportunities outside of commodities. Yeah, I think a lot of people would agree with you there. Seema, we only have about 30 seconds left with you. What is your highest conviction at this moment, would you say? I think you want to have 
increased exposure to, to equities, but it should be global diversification. There's no one clear segment of the market which is looking attractive with fundamentals as well. So this is the time to spread yourself out because actually the outlook for global equities is still really positive. All right, diversify. That's a good note to leave it on. Seema, it's great to see you, especially in person. That is Principal Asset Management Chief Global Strategist Seema Shah. Now coming up, this wine's got legs. A Napa vineyard is getting bought for nearly $2 billion. We'll have the details next in Social Climbers. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for Social Climbers. The company's making waves this morning. And first up, Boeing and its union will return to the bargaining table today, resuming negotiations as the strike enters its fourth week. Workers still holding out for better pay and pensions, but each day of the strike costs Boeing an estimated $100 million in lost sales. Next up, Chevron selling its stakes in some oil sands and shale assets to Canadian Natural Resources for $6.5 billion. The all-cash transaction expected to close in the fourth quarter, subject to regulatory approvals. And finally, luxury winemaker Duckhorn announcing it will be acquired by private equity funds managed by Butterfly in an all-cash deal that values the company at $1.95 billion, quite a premium there. You can see shares absolutely flying right now. And of course, you can follow all the latest company buzz on TREN Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Quick check on futures, of course, as we count down to those bells. You can see it's red all over from the S&P 500 to the NASDAQ 100 to your small caps, currently down about three tenths of a percent on the Russell 2000. We'll discuss all of it as we are less than four minutes to the opening bell with Stuart Kaiser of Citi. This is Bloomberg. Moments away from the start of trading, do we really need any more jumbo rate cuts? This is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. Take a look at futures now down uh, a third of 1% on the S&P, about half a percent on the NASDAQ. The concern that the strong jobs number we saw on Friday negates the need for any more serious uh, Fed cutting. In fact, um, we're no longer even pricing in a full 25 basis points in November. You hear the opening bell, Oracle, uh, Sunny Singh there ringing the bell at the New York Stock Exchange over on the NASDAQ, Sanofi ringing the bell. We're going to be talking about a competitor of theirs, Pfizer, getting a billion dollar investment by Starboard a little bit later on. Right now, in terms of the uh, major averages, as we kick off this week, earnings week, uh, Katie Greifeld, what do we see in terms of the moves? Well, Matt, it's not even jumbo rate cuts. It's do we need any rate cuts at all? Plenty of people asking that question this morning. And you're seeing that question being asked in the markets right now. The S&P 500 currently off by about three-tenths of a percent. A little bit more if you take a look at the NASDAQ 100, your big tech average there. And a little bit more even if you take a look at the small caps. The Russell 2000 currently down about four-tenths of a percent. The question becomes, what does the driver become? But we'll ask that to Stuart Kaiser in just about a minute. Some stocks to watch here, though. Let's take a look at Apple and Amazon shares, really dragging down overall markets after Apple downgraded by Jefferies over iPhone sales pessimism, while you had Amazon cut by Wells Fargo on glowed cr cloud growth concerns, rather, Shanali. Also keeping an eye here on Pfizer, moving up about 2.3% as the market opens. That says activist investor Starboard Value is betting nearly a billion dollar on the drug makers turnaround plans, even reaching out to former executives for that plan. It has spent more than 65 billion Pfizer in acquisition since 2022. We'll keep an eye on that story for you. And Matt, I know you're watching more m &A. Yeah, Rio Tinto has approached Arcadium Lithium for a potential takeover as the mining sector turns its attention back to growth. Arcadium is one of the world's largest lithium miners with operations in Argentina, China, Canada, and Australia. So we do see a lot of M&A action from uh, wine to, I guess, rare earth. Yeah, is there lithium you have. a rare earth? I don't think. Rare earth. It, I don't know. It's I don't know. in any case, you need it for stuff. batteries. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. look into this offline, but let's get now to City U.S. Equity Trading Strategy Head, Stuart Kaiser, joining us on set. Stuart, it's great to see you. Morning. I won't ask you about rare earths, but I will ask you about this reaction that we're seeing in the markets. We just had a great conversation with Seamus Shaw, who said 
This is a strange reaction. Life is good. You have the Fed cutting into economic strength. This should be a good news day, and yet the arrows are all going down. Yeah, I agree. It should be a good news day. I think you're still kind of in bull case category. Maybe you're not in his uber bull case category. You know, an uber bull case was you're getting the Fed kind of cutting relatively aggressively into a sort of solid to modestly slowing economy. Um, you know, the Fed, excuse me, the markets have taken some of those rate cuts away. But, like, you know, maybe to see his point, I think big picture, you know, having stronger growth data is much more important than pricing out a couple cuts in our view. So, you know, we would still be relatively positive on the, on the outlook for equity markets here. You know, you wrote over the weekend that you could actually see an increase in equity markets here, a rise into the election season. SEMA actually even called it a melt up, potentially. So what does that look like and what would drive it? I mean, what we're driving, I think, is you get a friendly inflation print this week so the Fed can kind of keep gradually getting themselves back towards neutral at a time when, you know, earnings growth and economic growth hold in. So I think you need a sort of inline inflation print on Wednesday and then the start of earnings season. You just hope that that looks a little bit cleaner um, than last earnings season. So this is this is a growth story. There's a growth market we're living so in. So I was actually out on Friday going to my last brother's <laughs> you wedding. You keep mentioning that. Well, because the jobs number, I was still like plugged into my Bloomberg, right? Yeah. And um, when I saw the number 254,000, I thought, wow, I think that's exactly the margin of error, mm. right? I mean, this is such a noisy data set. Um, does it really, is it really a game changer? I mean, can we really say now, oh man, the labor market's super strong, or are we going to see downward revisions the last, next th two or three months? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't call it a full game changer, but I, I think the, the thing with Friday was you had a strong jobs number, you had positive revisions, and you had the unemployment rate fall. So every sort of metric in the labor market data was positive and supportive. So I think that's what, what's got it, kind of got people a little bit more convinced. You know, in our view, like, I think the markets respond to payrolls. That tends to be what we focus on the most. But it does seem like the Fed is much more sort of focused in on the unemployment rate. And to get that unemployment rate back to 4.05 percent, I think, was a, a big step for them. So not a full game changer, but but definitely a, a flip in sentiment in our view, you know, at least until the next one on, on November yeah. 1st. Yeah, <laughs> of course, right before the election, too. But, Stuart, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how this raises the stakes, if at all, for that CPI release that we're going to get later in the week. Because one of the things that freaked the bond market out, which, Nal, you identified last week was that rise that we saw above expectations in average hourly earnings. And with that in mind, I mean, this market, these traders have been so content to just sort of ignore inflation, say that's mission accomplished, but maybe not. Yeah, I mean, I do think the market is trading it as if we're on a downward inflation trend, and you might get some volatility in there. But I think, you know, people will view this as still a downward trending inflation market. Uh, to your point, though, after last week's high print, after a strong payrolls, if you were to get an upside surprise, then, you know, maybe, maybe the argument there is nominal growth is at a level where the Fed doesn't need to or shouldn't be cutting. So, you know, big picture, I think you're going to need a relatively significant beat for that to happen. But to your point, you know, accumulation of data, you know, two in a row plus a strong payrolls report, you know, could get people talking much more in that direction, but hopefully that not the case. Hopefully we get a friendly print and we just rally. I want to he hear more about the wages as it pertains to earnings in particular, because if wages are on the rise, uh, that is an input cost. And why wouldn't margins be more constrained in that scenario, especially with potential supply chain constraints here when you're watching what's going on around the globe? Yeah, look, it's interesting. Coming into the year, that would have been your fundamental downside from an equity perspective, which is nominal growth declines, but wage inflation is positive. So you get this kind of tough issue where your revenue line is slowing, but your wage inflation is, is rising behind that, and you do get margin pressure. You know, maybe we saw a little bit of that last quarter, but the, fr the, the fact is earnings have just remained strong. So I, I agree that's a risk. That's sort of your fundamental risk in the background. But I think the market's going to have to see the white, white of the eyes on that one uh, before they really react to it. We're waiting to see the whites of the eyes uh, starting on Friday, right, mm -hmm. in terms of the big banks kicking off earnings season. Sonali is already preparing. The Probably was curve. last week. The yield curve. <laughs> yeah. So um, what do you expect from the big banks? And what do you think about, you know, sectors, industries? Where do you, where do you like Look, I think you know bank, banks are going to be important, obviously, kind of set the tone for what they're seeing from a credit risk perspective and on the economy. But look, the earnings season is going to be basically October 24th to November 1st, give or take, which is when you get those large cap you know, tech stocks reporting. So last, last quarter, that number was a little bit... I, Wait, you know, are you poo-pooing the banks? Is she, <laughs> he's poo-pooing <laughs> the big banks. Hey, listen, the yield curve being inverted into today and losing its steepener, I have questions, too, on how well they can do. I, it's an issue. Obviously, I'm not going to get myself into compliance issue by talking about banks uh, <laughs> a week ahead of earnings. Um, look, I think it, it, the, the three take or four takeaways we care about this quarter. Number one is last quarter you had the 493 generate EPS growth for the first time in a year and a half. That's hugely important to the broadening trade. Banks, what are they saying about the economy and credit risk? 
tech is a margin issue, and then really late in earnings, you're going to get an update on consumer spend. So those are going to kind of be the, the, the three things to talk That's about. That's a good roadmap. Yeah, and look, I, I agree. Like the, 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 the two's tens has become an interesting topic just because, in our view, once you get out of inversion, the market starts to trade growth. Once you get back into inversion, it becomes a much different game, both for the banks and for, uh, and for cyclicals in the market as well. So, you know, two's tens, really important, and we'll have to just see how that decides to settle out. I will say that financials are only 13% of the S&P 500. And if you take a look at what is actually in that sector, it's not a lot of banks, to be honest. So it's a lot of fintech, et cetera. So we'll see, of course, the big banks matter for what they say about the economy. But and because they're our viewers, right? That's Our true. clients and well, viewers. We don't, we don't say that out loud. It's big bank TV. Well, in any case. They matter to the capital markets, I think, here. If you don't have credit being extended to the economy, how quick can these companies really grow on the heels of that, I think, is the main question. These are all important questions. But just making the point, it's a pretty small slice of the overall market. But before we let you go, of course, you are head of der equity to derivative strategy as well. And when you take a look at what options markets are braced for, what people are positioned for, what screens out to you right now? Look, I mean, at this point, you have very little event risk priced in really until the, until the election. And, you know, election risk pricing is extremely high. You know, you're at, you know, two and a half percent type implied move for the S&P 500, almost four percent for small cap. So I think really now that we're past payrolls, the market is really going to start to to really narrow in on what's being priced in for election risk and, and kind of how they want to trade that. Um, you know, you talked about bank earnings. We had a big volatility shock in August. So I think that's one thing kind of under the surface people are going to be taking a look at. Do these banks benefit from that market volatility, or, or does that does that become a headwind? But in terms of vol, I mean, vol is pretty much calmed down right now. You're trading basically CPI, jobs. The VIX is at 21, though. Yeah, but if you look at, like, forward implied volatility, that risk is concentrated in just a couple of days. It's concentrated on Wednesday for inflation. It's concentrated on November 1st, and then it's concentrated in the election. So right. you're kind of like, basically, it's an appointment-only type market. We're going to trade <laughs> two or three days for the next month. In between those days, the market's, you know, Get to take a little bit of a breather, like Matt did on Friday. 20, 2165, what's high anymore anyway? Stuart, thank you for joining us. That is thank Stuart you. Kaiser, City's head of U.S. equity trading strategy. Now coming up, a look at big pharma. Activist investor Starboard seeking a turnaround at Pfizer. We're going to talk about what's up with that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Abigail Doolittle in the principal room. Coming up, an interview with Stephanie Gill, Robin Hood Financial Head of Investment Strategy. That's at 10 a.m. Eastern. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Open Interest. Let's take a quick check on stocks right now. And I wore green. Chanali did too. It's not making any difference in the market, unsurprisingly. The S&P 500 off about three-tenths of a percent. And it gets even worse if you go down the list. The big tech index, your NASDAQ 100, off by about half a percent. Same thing if you take a look at the Russell 2000. Of course, investors questioning the Fed's rate-cutting path from here. But let's move on to some of our top calls. The analyst action in focus this morning. We have a lot to get to. First, First up, Barclays downgrading Netflix to a sell. The analyst says that the company's premium valuation, too optimistic, also sees revenue growth slowing from here. Netflix, of course, reports earnings next week. Next up, Jeffries upgrading Cody to a buy. The firm is confident in the beauty company's ability to expand its prestige portfolio. And as the company has less exposure to China and a very attractive valuation, shares currently up about 5% or so. And finally, we have J.P. Morgan upgrading Ally Financial to a buy following the recent sell-off. The analyst says that investors should be taking profits on consumer finance stocks and says that Ally reflects the opportunity created amid rapid swings in sentiment, Matt. All right. Now, another stock that we're watching, we've been talking about today, is Pfizer. Activist investor Starboard Value is said to have taken a nearly $1 billion stake a $1 billion stake in the drug maker. Let's discuss, um, I guess, the potential for a turnaround for Pfizer with Bloomberg's Madison Muller, because Madison, this was, I think, a $300 billion stock at one point, and now it's trading at about half that. Yeah, and, and this stake isn't huge, and, and but what we know is that Pfizer is used to being a pharma darling. I mean, during the pandemic, they were really top of their game. We're all used to talking about them, knowing them. Um, their revenue doubled during the pandemic to 100 billion. And so what we know is that 
investors are not happy with Pfizer's performance post-pandemic. They've struggled to develop an obesity pill. They've struggled to really find their next big hit. And so they're hoping for a turnaround. Part of the story that amuses me a lot is that the activists here at Starboard reached out to former executives, Ian Reid, Frank D'Amelio, two executives known for their buying spree. What is it exactly does he want here, Jeff Smith over at Starboard? Is it more acquisitions? Do we know? We don't know really yet, but one of the things that we have been hearing is that investors are not happy with Pfizer's M&A strategy in particular. Um, Albert Borla, who's been Pfizer's CEO for the last few years, a name that many people know, um, has done a lot of deals you know, post-pandemic, but so far those deals have not really yielded the results as quickly enough as investors were hoping for. This is a great full screen list, by the way, because these are deals that were done under Borla, mm -hmm, right? Exactly. Not the predecessors that Chanali says we're also acquisitive. This is the problem. Um, you know, they're not yielding any blockbuster drugs. Right, and I mean, we know the Siegen acquisition, huge acquisition, we do expect that will yield some blockbusters, but not for another few years. It's not really happening as quickly enough as investors had hoped to uh, replace the dwindling revenue from the COVID vaccine and treatment that the demand is just not there for anymore. Well, shareholders clearly welcoming the news today. Pfizer shares currently up 3.6% uh, in trading. But talk to us a little bit more about the pipeline. You mentioned, of course, uh, their struggles to create a viable obesity drug, try to tap into that craze. But what exactly are they cooking up right now, especially after all those recent acquisitions? Yeah, I mean, Pfizer has really set its, its sights on cancer. That is the big thing. I mean, they came out with this big Super Bowl ad, you know, talking all about cancer. They've really tried to, like, rebrand themselves as a cancer company after the pandemic. They've also tried to develop an obesity pill like we've talked about so many times on this show. Obesity is mm -hmm. the next big thing. Um, Pfizer has really struggled with that so far. They do have an obesity pill in development. It's a once daily pill, but you know, it, it, analysts are not super hopeful that that's going to be the next big thing and it, that that's going to be able to compete with all of the other obesity drugs that are in development. Um, they have a you know, migraine drug that they got through the acquisition of Biohaven, but again, that's not a huge blockbuster yet. So really just, I think, you know, that's the, the big question is like, what else in the pipeline are, is gonna get people excited? And even on M&A, that Seijin deal is one of the top five completed deals, but you kind of have to go further back uh, beyond Borla to mm -hmm. find anything close to that size. Madison, we thank you so much for your reporting, keeping an eye on all things Pfizer and Pharma. Now coming up, we're gonna turn to banks, banks versus private credit. Banks are reclaiming debt deals from the world of private credit. We're gonna discuss what's going on in our Wall Street feed. This is Bloomberg. It's time now for the Wall Street Beat. Big Bank set to kick off earnings season at the end of the week, and all eyes will be on competition from private credit. Joining us now is Richard Farley, partner and chair of the Leverage Finance Group at the law firm Kramer, Levin, Naftalis, and Frankel. One reason that they're watching the private credit kind of diaspora here as it relates to the banks is because of underwriting, right. deals coming back, and a lot of them have. That is pure fees for the banks. What's the dynamic under the surface? Well, look, I, I think it's, it's been viewed too long as uh, a purely competitive dynamic, right? Uh, the banks versus the private credit providers, and, and I think that's going to change going forward. Uh, what you need is really a combination of capital and origination capability, and also scale. So I, I think what we're seeing now is partnerships and joint ventures between large banks and large credit providers. The banks have the origination. Uh, they may not be able to put certain loans on their balance sheet for regulatory and other reasons, and the amount of capital going to the private credit space has become absolutely enormous, and they need that origination capability. And obviously we saw last week the joint venture between Apollo and Citibank, which I think is just the first of uh, marriages of this type. So it sounds like you're looking for more joint partnerships along those lines. Then. I think they're going to have to, right? I mean, well, what choice do you have when you have a client who wants to do an acquisition, but the loan doesn't meet the regulatory guidelines, you're going to wave goodbye and hand them over to uh, a private credit provider, or are you going to try to harvest those fees in, in, in part? Uh, I think we know the obvious answer. Right. Uh, but you have to have enough scale and expertise to be able to do that regularly 
and keep the flow and not be disappointing your client because you've got someone who's going to be you know, not able in terms of the supply of capital to service those needs. So I think the large players on both the commercial banking side and mm -hmm. the private credit side are going to have to have these arrangements. We'll weigh in on some recent research that we got mm -hmm. from Bank of America. Uh, they found that almost $30 billion of private debt has been refinanced through the broadly syndicated loan space across more than 70 deals so far right. this year. So it feels like maybe banks are starting to take back some share well, from private it, credit. It isn't really taking back. It's, it's, it's really more of where are interest rates, where is the syndicated market, demand versus private credit, mm -hmm. and it's going to ebb and flow. And, and, and when it ebbs, you don't want to be sitting there twiddling your thumbs. You want to have a relationship where you can put that in a private credit space. So I, I think it's, it's, it's not driven by, okay, how do we get more of these loans that were in private credit back in the syndicated market? You can't control the investor appetite. It, you, you can't control rates. I mean, it's a great point because when we saw the Apollo City deal, I think I made some ignorant comment to Shanali along the lines of, they have 240,000 employees, they can't even build this in-house, but you're saying that's not, that's not really the point. That's not the issue, yeah. right? The point is that the regulators don't want you making certain loans, whereas a private credit absolutely wants those loans. So there's a natural synergy but between sure. those relationships. Explain this to me. Something sure. I don't understand is that you have groups like the Managed Funds Association really pushing these types of deals and other research posted online from former FDIC chair Sheila Bear over the weekend saying, look at where the risk is going. It's not in the banks. It's over there. Should you not be more concerned that risk that is not deemed appropriate for banks in this juncture is being held on what's now becoming the balance sheet of insurance companies instead well, of pensions? Well, the, the people who hold those loans are compensated on the basis of how those loans perform. So uh, I think when your compensation is directly tied to the performance of the loan, I think you're going to do your diligence and be very careful. It isn't like the purchasers of private credit are, aren't re retaining a significant portion of those loans. They are. They're going on the balance sheet. And it isn't like a private equity fund where one grand slam can make up for a few strikeouts. If you get a zero in debt, you, you've got a major problem. What do these conversations look like for you under the surface? Because you see a merger Monday, like today, two take privates, multi-billion ones just this morning. How much more are you seeing ahead and what role do private credit firms play? I think private credit is going to continue to play an increasing role. Uh, I think that once we get this election behind us and hopefully a little more geopolitical stability, uh, I think there's going to be a little more of the animal spirits. I think right now things are still a bit restrained. We do have an interest rate environment that's moving in the right direction and an economy that seems to be holding up. And Powell looks to be the, you know, the man of the year if this mm -hmm. holds up. Uh, so I think everyone's very optimistic, but we've got the next month or two uh, to sort of get through this period of unease. So, and perhaps uh, longer on, on the geopolitical issues. So we have uh, bank earnings kicking off Friday, mm -hmm. and I just wonder, in terms of credit, cr cri private credit, and you have such uh, long experience with these big firms, who are the ones that we should be watching? Like, who are the ones where the uh, pr private credit earnings are going to stand out? Yeah, look, I think you want to look at the... Um, largest players, right, which in terms of the U.S. banks are going to be J.P. Morgan, Wells, and Citi. Um, I, I think those four are, are, are probably the ones to keep a close eye in terms of this space. Uh, because when you get into the funding of large leverage buyouts, uh, those are really the big American players. Now, of course, you have the Barclays and the UBSs and the others in terms of European banks and uh, BMO and RBC in terms mm -hmm. of, the, of the Canadian banks. In terms of U.S. banks, I think those four are the key to keep your eye on. And all he right. named firms which all have private credit partnerships. Yeah. Fun fact. <laughs> all right, exactly. Richard, great having you in. My Love pleasure. your expertise you on this me. stuff. Richard Farley there of Kramer, Levin, Natalis, and Frankel. Coming up in the next hour, Robin Hood's head of investment strategy talks about Wall Street's reluctant reaction to the strong economic readings. The NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center's Nicola Corzine on the standout states for new business. This is Bloomberg.
We are 30 minutes into this trading day. Welcome to Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Bassett. And I'm Katie Greifeld. And coming up, countdown to big bank results. Earnings season kicks off this week with reports from J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo in focus. One year on, the deepening conflict in the Middle East continues to reverberate across the globe and the tight race for the White House. And back to the table, Boeing and its largest labor union return to wage discussions after two weeks of stalemate. All that and more coming up. Let's take a check on these markets, though. As Matt mentioned, we are 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day, and boy, it's a rough start. You take a look at the S&P 500, currently down about four-tenths of a percent. A little bit worse if you take a look at big tech, currently down about uh, half a percent, six-tenths of a percent on the NASDAQ 100. All as investors question what the Fed is going to do when it comes to the rate-cutting cycle. And you can see those questions in the bond market right now. Your 10-year Treasury yield, five basis points higher, above 4%, Matt. All right, let's uh, shift to geopolitical tensions and a spike in energy prices. Those are pushing hedge funds to reverse their course and buy energy stocks for the first time in seven weeks. We have, as earlier teased, Bloomberg's Natalia Knijevich. She is here with a look at where investors are putting money and where they're taking it away. Natalia? Hi, Matt. Yes, we saw this huge uh, buying in the energy space, and we know that hedge funds are had, had a big uh, short positioning in energy space. And we see that this latest buying came mostly because hedge funds covered those short positions. We also see some buying in utilities and uh, healthcare. So this is basically your defensive play. It's really interesting to keep an eye on the technology space. So on the one hand, we see that Infotech was uh, bought last week. This is data from Goldman Sachs Prime Brokerage. But on the other hand, this buying was mainly driven by software stocks and hedge funds keep selling Magnificent Seven. Uh, we now, if we look at the ratio of Magnificent Seven stocks versus overall total exposure to US stocks, this ratio among hedge funds is now at the lowest level, guys, since May 2023. And now let's like, take a look at the options market and see how people are positioned. So this is your QQQ ETF. And this chart shows ratio between bullish call options versus bull, uh, bearish put options. Now it's dropped to the level we last saw right here. So that was around this big sell-off in August. So now let's take a look, take a step back and see how commodity trading advisors are positioning. And they are basically selling stocks no matter which direction the market goes. So Katie, the question is, was this jobs report on Friday, is it enough uh, for a bullish case uh, for investors or technical positioning is still really, really concerning? That is the question, of course, that push and pull of positioning beautifully laid out. That is Natalia Kanijevich. And let's broaden out this conversation now. We're joined now by Stephanie Guild. She is Robin Hood Financial's head of investment strategy. She has a year-end S&P 500 target of 5,800 with a 20% probability of going to 6,100. Stephanie, it's great to see you again. Likewise. <laughs> so some big numbers there when it comes to your target, but I want to focus in on today's action. Of course, we've been saying that you have investors rethinking what the Fed is going to do from here, what they're even going to do in November when it comes to rate cuts. And if we blueprint this forward. If it's not big Fed rate cuts that are going to push the market higher from here, what does the narrative become? What's the catalyst? I think it's just economic growth. Like the market is reluctantly saying that good is good again, right? Mm -hmm. But the reluctance is certainly there because they want rates to be lower. They want the Fed to cut more. But the Fed, I don't think, needs to cut well, market expectations have come in from there, but the Fed doesn't need to cut a huge amount because we do have good economic growth. I mean, the jobs mark, jobs said that, um, and I believe that we are in the fourth uh, soft landing since 1960. So that's why, I mean, I look at a survey of strategists, and if I put you in there among the, the 22 that we have yeah. collected at Bloomberg, you're in the top four in terms of your target. But everybody else, you know, has targets lower than where we are now. Yeah. Um, and these are updated stats, like updated at the end of September. Yeah, so why Goldman do you think? Updated theirs. Why do you think the rest of the street is so? 
Because there's a lot of risk. I think there's a lot of risk. Like Peter Lynch said that the best organ you can have in investing is your stomach, not your brain. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true, right? Like there are a lot of things happening. The market valuations are high at 21 and a half times. We do have geopolitical tensions that are rising, not falling. But you also have stimulus coming from uh, China, which is probably going to increase demand for oil. That's why oil prices are higher. You do have a risk of a deficit going higher. Um, and that's why I think, you know, the 10 year can probably be elevated and is up today and is probably causing some strife in the market. Um, so there's a it's it's a we're definitely, I think, in a soft landing. It's never going to be a perfect landing. And to your point, Stephanie, you're right. You had Goldman's David Costin raising his uh, 12 month target for the S&P 500 yeah. to 60 300 Sonali, that's a 10% gain it's above me. But that means only five out of 22 strategists mm -hmm. from all the biggest banks are above where we are right are now. Are above where we are now. But you know, yeah. that bullish sentiment, something I love that you did was that 20% probability that we can get to 6,100. Yeah. So probability here, there should always be distributions of outcomes. Yeah. What would bring you there? And what is the tail risk that you stay below that 5,800 that you think is your base case? Uh, two things that I'm watching closely is just the job market, which obviously Friday showed was pretty strong or even the whole week even if you just looked at ADP it was better than expected and so if there's some change of that where participation comes down or you know the hiring rate comes down a lot like that's you know or the unemployment rate gets to four and a half percent that's where I start to get nervous and then I think the other thing is just watching um, the debt market like if rates get really really high I think you could end up you can just end up having a lot of wobbles in like the small cap space or um, you know, even like you talked about before, the private credit space. <laughs> well, let's talk about that a little bit more. At what is the threshold for pain when it comes to those small caps? You have uh, the 10 year yield right now at 4%. Are we there? Is it higher? What are you thinking? No, I think because we I think we've been at 4% before. I don't think so. I think once you get to five or higher, then you start to get a low. Uh, you know, that's why I actually I like mid caps because they're less expensive than large caps, but they're not as a little higher quality, I'd say, than small caps. Right. Where do you see Robinhood investors um, putting their money? And I think it's a different market than you would see at Goldman Sachs, for example. So what's the retail market doing right now? They do what they always have done all year, which is sell the things that work and, and invest in the things that uh, maybe have been down a bit more. So we've seen them actually broadening out more. You know, MAG7 were, was always been really popular and continues to be, but I've noticed in the last month, you know, Tesla was doing well and they trimmed those positions and started diversifying amongst things. You also see just a good amount of buying in broad based, um, you know, index funds. So I think it's, it's, you're just seeing kind of a spreading of bets, which probably makes sense because if you are going to have a strong economic cycle that continues and is not fully expected, you should have but a broader base. Do you get any indica indication of, you know, we hear so much talk about cash on the sidelines and there's six and a half mm -hmm. trillion, uh, trillion in money markets right now. Um, when rates come down, that should flow back out into equities, but it mm -hmm. doesn't really seem to happen that much. That line doesn't turn lower. It's not materially happening, but because yeah. if it was only 0.5% in the you know drop in the yield, like we have an a four and a half percent yield on our cash for gold members, um, it's still a nice return. I think on the margin, there's a little bit of that happening, but we haven't seen it be material yet. You know, it's interesting. You're talking about Tesla, Mag7 names. Vanilla compared to what we see out there these days. We have a story very hotly read on the terminal right now about derivatives, enhanced ETFs, uh, levered trades through ETFs as well. How much risk is a retail investor willing to put on at this juncture? We're seeing more broader spreading of bets and, and less so going into, I mean, look, we do have our customers that invest in like extra long, you know, uh, Q3Q Q trades or, you know, inverse. But we we haven't seen that as much as actually just going on the single stock basis and, and selling things that work and buying things that do uh, haven't worked more recently. And it's interesting. I mean, you take a look at the turnover on those types of ETFs. It's very, very uh, fast how long it actually takes for those shares to turn over. So people aren't buying and holding them, at least on average. There. No, I mean, and they're not meant to be long term Exactly. Investments. They're meant to be tools to trade in the short term. <laughs> when, that's what we see. when you think about the Robin Hood investor base, though, it's interesting to hear about that spreading of bets yeah. that you're seeing. What would you say that the biggest concern to the Robin Hood investor is? Because, of course, you survey Wall Street, some of the big money managers that we speak to all the time. You hear a mixture of inflation, geopolitical concerns, the election. I mean, what is the, the center of worry when it comes to Robin Hood? I think it's two things. One is inflation is just always an issue for 
the consumer, right? And that doesn't, our customer base, our everyday people that are buying things that are costing, still cost more, maybe a little less more than they used to. Um, and then the other thing is just uh, markets in general going down. Like I, a common question is, okay, markets are up a lot, you know, we're close to all time highs right now, should I sell? And it's and that's not actually specific just to the retail base. I think that's you know broadly and even in the institutional base. And I, our answer is always depends on your time horizon. Mm -hmm. If you're in it for the long term, which most of our customers, you know, our average age is 34, you you know if you if you're not going to need the money in the next year, you should be able to take a longer term. I think view. that would surprise a lot of people. 34 is that the does surprise guy. me, and yeah. I don't know if it's just because I'm so old <laughs> or. But He's I don't. Not that old. I, I wasn't investing. Did you think heavily. that was young or old? I thought that was quite young. Oh. The average age oh, of yeah. an investor is 34. Yeah, I guess I it mean, says it a lot about your, us. Yeah. Yeah. Diversity <laughs> of opinions. Here. You know, if you're not using your father's playbook anymore on how to invest, you know, buy, hold, stick with that single name stock. Or your the, mother's playbook. Or your mother's playbook. Uh, <laughs> invest through the course of your retirement, essentially. How long are people holding individual names at this point for? I actually, I would say that they are using the old playbook. They're just, to me, being a little smarter about it because there is a easier way to have awareness. So what we see is actually like you're holding your positions long term and then if it goes up a bit, they're trimming it. If it goes down a bit, they're adding to it. So actually I think they're more savvy in many ways. Doesn't mean that they can't benefit from guidance, but we have a lot of people who put money in retirement accounts and um, you know investing for the long term, but trading around. Stephanie, great having you in. We love to get this kind of snapshot, so that's why we pepper you with these questions. <laughs> Stephanie Guild, uh, Robin Hood Financial Head of Investment Strategy. Let's get a look now at the individual stocks moving at this hour. To kick off the week, for that, we go to Abigail Doodle. Abby? Well, Matt, let's take a look at the shares of Netflix start out here because we do, of course, have the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100 down. This is one of the uh, pressing points for these indexes, given that shares are down 2.4%. Barclays has cut shares to an under weight uh, from an equal weight ahead of the earnings report on valuation and the idea that revenue growth, it's probably those expectations are too optimistic. On the other hand, we have uh, Piper Sandler raising shares to an overweight from a neutral saying that the company has multiple levers to to pull around its ad-free business. It seems though that investors clearly going with the bearish call today, maybe because the stock is up so much on the year. Turning to the shares of DJT, uh, we do see that Trump Media and Technology up 13.6%, the best day in nearly a month, up for a third day in a row. This after Elon Musk and perhaps his biggest Bucks uh, supporter joined him in Butler, Pennsylvania at a rally that, of course, was the site of the uh, attempted assassination, the assassination attempt that the former president survived. Tesla, on the other hand down 1.6 percent. Maybe investors concerned he's spending more time on that campaign and politics than on Tesla. And then finally, the casino stocks. We do have a bit of a rally here. Uh, it looks like the Macau data for uh, the holiday week, golden week, uh, was very strong. So these shares higher. In addition, Wynn has received a gaming operator license in UAE, Sonali. That seems to be giving these stocks another lift, which again, up some of these stocks, up 30 percent over the last couple of weeks on uh, the stimulus in China and that relationship to Macau. Abigail, thank you so very much. Now coming up, John Kerry joins billionaire Tom Steyer's sustainable investing firm. More on that and other headlines from around the world next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get to high interest now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Hurricane Milton is intensifying on its path towards Florida with the storm expected to reach a category four status. The potential for devastation to Tampa and surrounding areas is already estimated to cause tens of billions of dollars in damage. Milton will be the second major storm to strike Florida in less than two weeks and the fifth hurricane to hit the U.S. this year. Billionaire Tom Steyer has hired former U.S. Secretary of State and presidential candidate John Kerry to be co-executive chair of his sustainable investing firm. Kerry was the U.S.'s top climate diplomat until he stepped down from the Biden administration earlier this year. He is also the latest climate elder statesman to get involved in sustainable investing after former VP Al Gore co-founded his own firm two decades ago.
And fighting in the Middle East is intensifying after Hamas fired rockets at Israel from Gaza. One year has now passed since Hamas fighters stormed into southern Israel, setting off a chain of turmoil which has engulfed the region ever since. Uh, in Israel, 1,200 people were killed and 250 others taken hostage. Around 100 remain in Gaza. Israel has killed 42,000 Palestinians in Gaza and around 2,000 people in Lebanon. Shanali? And returning to Washington, both candidates in the upcoming U.S. election have been marking the one-year milestone since the Hamas October 7th attack. Now joining us for the latest on the race for the White House is Bloomberg's chief political correspondent Anne-Marie Hordern. And let's fast forward one year because, of course, there has been more tensions escalating in the Middle East. How much does the Biden administration's response here really paint a picture over what the Harris administration would do in the future and her campaign ahead? There hasn't been a lot of daylight between the two. She will talk a lot about the fact that she wants a ceasefire and she spoke to 60 Minutes over the weekend. We got a little bit of that clip. We'll see more of her potentially uh, how she views foreign policy when they release that interview this evening. Um, but obviously this has weighed over the Biden administration and now the Harris campaign. She was just in Flint, Michigan on Friday talking to Arab Americans. Remember one year ago, Biden came out very staunchly. He even flew to Israel. But through the course of the year, as now this is really a multi-pronged fight that Israel is on, not just with Hamas in Gaza, and they're now in northern Gaza again today, but with Hezbollah and then the two attacks uh, from Iran, the barrage of missiles we saw in April and then most recently a few weeks ago, you see that there's been progressives within the Democratic Party wanting to push them to push Netanyahu to really end these conflicts in the region, whether it's with Hamas or Hezbollah and also with Arab Americans. So obviously, Politically, this has weighed on them. But today is really going to be about marking the devastation of those individuals that died from the terrorist attack on October 7th. President Biden will be speaking about an hour and a half time. Kamala Harris will be planting a tree in their memory. And also former President Donald Trump is also attending an event today uh, with Jewish Americans. So it's less than one month until the election, Anne-Marie. What does the horse race look like right now? Um, do both have a pa clear path to victory? It's on a knife's edge, and you look within all these polls, within the margin of error, so anyone that tells you with conviction they know what's going to happen, um, I would think twice. I think there's some interesting developments that we need to take into consideration. One is going to be the hurricanes. Uh, Political ran the numbers over the weekend. In Western North Carolina, close to one million votes were cast in 2020 in the 25 counties designated for FEMA assistance. In Georgia, close to 650,000 votes were cast in more than 40 FEMA designated counties there. There is concern, and you see this from the former president who's trying to politicize what's going on with FEMA, mm -hmm. although I've spoken to a lot of these offices of governors that are running, that are Republican, that are in uh, southeastern states hit by Helene. They're saying they're getting all the federal funding that they can. But if people don't have power, if people don't have access to clean water, they can't even send their kids to school. Do you think that potentially in a month's time are they going to be able to go to vote? And the concern here for the Republicans is that these are some Republican-led districts. We have less than a minute left with you, but it's interesting to see both campaigns in the last month of campaigning, what their strategies are. Did you listen to Kamala Harris on Call Her Daddy? I did listen to Kamala Harris on Call Her Daddy. Listen to both of them, whatever outlets they're on. Uh, clearly, what she's doing this week is really friendly media. 60 Minutes, traditional journalist, but a lot of Stephen friendly Colbert. media. The View, uh, Call Her Daddy. That was really about talking to women and getting to their hearts and minds about abortion, something she is strong on. Um, but clearly, they're trying to pick out parts of the electorate they want to make sure go out and vote. All right, Anne-Marie, uh, you've got a busy month ahead of you. That, of course, is Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern. Now, still ahead, high levels of human carcinogen have been found at unacceptably high levels in popular acne products. Details next in our Social Climbers. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for Social Climbers. The company's making waves this morning. And first up, American Waterworks. It's a company that supplies drinking water and wastewater services to over 14 million people. 
It said that hackers had breached its computer networks and systems. Now, U.S. government officials and cybersecurity researchers have been warning recently that hackers are increasingly targeting water infrastructure. Next up, we have Amazon falling after Wells Fargo cut its recommendation on the e-commerce giant. The firm saying that the company is facing multiple headwinds and the strength in Amazon Web Services isn't enough to offset those challenges. And finally, a new analysis of acne creams and cleansers found that dozens of products contain high levels of a chemical linked to cancer. Researchers tested over 100 benzoyl peroxide acne products available at major retailers in six states, and a CVS brand face wash had 13 times the levels that are considered safe by the FDA. Of course, you can follow all the latest company buzz on TREN Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Meanwhile, let's take a look at these markets here about an hour into the trading day and still a down day. We're looking at the S&P 500 off by about three tenths of a percent off slightly from its worst levels of the session. The Nasdaq 100, meanwhile, same story, still down three tenths of a percent. Not as bad as what we were looking at a little while earlier, but still a down day to start this week. And then you take a look at the bond market, and that seems to be what the equity market is taking its cues from this morning. That 10-year Treasury yield currently higher by about five basis points above 4 percent. And you're seeing that across the curve as well as investors wonder, what is next for this Federal Reserve after that very st strong labor report that we got on Friday? Maybe they don't need to cut rates at all in November. Big questions, Matt, and you can see that reflected in the markets this morning. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, th they're no longer pricing in any possibility of a 50 basis point rate cut. It's barely 25, and there's, a, I think, a 10 percent chance that they do no rate cut at all in November. So that could be a little frightening to investors who had planned for a cut at every meeting, um, at least through the end of this year. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the top states advancing entrepreneurial equity. We speak with Nick Nicola Corzine, executive director of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. Next, this is Bloomberg. The Venture Equity Project has named its top areas advancing equity for female entrepreneurs. Washington, D.C. topping that list, with Colorado being named the top state. The study finding there are still significant gaps in venture equity, but progress is being made. Joining us with more is Nicola Corzine, executive director of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. Nicola, great to have you in, uh, in the studio on the program. It's interesting because I follow this um, very closely. I talk with Jesse Draper a lot mm -hmm. from Halogen Ventures, and you know she always tells me it's still less than 2% of venture capital money goes to female founders, which shocks me that we haven't made any progress. Are you delivering good news today? <laughs> well, we certainly hope so. I mean, we still have a long way to go. I think you teed that up very well. But there is a lot more equity that is occurring across state lines. And I think when we think about our nation and the innovation economy, hopefully that's the brightest light of all, is that it's not finally limited to just the coastal tensions that have existed in entrepreneurship. Well, let's get specific there. You have some great data on what the top five states are when you take a look at advancing equity for female entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs, Hispanic entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Talk us through who some of the top slots are here. Yeah, absolutely. So when we look across our what we're calling equity innovation leaders, there's some real interesting insights that emerge. So for example, our seven innovation leaders that we're identifying right now are looking at Georgia, Illinois, Maryland, Michigan, Florida, and Texas. Now, across those environments, there's some certain consistencies that are emerging. For example, they're all KPI-driven innovations. They're all doing radical collaborations in really inspiring ways. They're certainly looking at continuous experimentation, so they're not limiting themselves as far as saying, we're just going to do a one-and-done moment. And ultimately, they're unlocking this $640 billion opportunity that has been identified for innovation equity in America. You know, at the end of the day, what do you think is their advantage here? Is this demographics on the side of these states, or is it a matter of how they're regulating and uh, taxing these companies? What is driving growth? Great questions. I would say what we can see right now is that there are certain environments where there is a new truth behind entrepreneurial equity. What I mean by that is that perhaps while pattern matching has always been the challenge in advancing equity and entrepreneurship, there are certain regions that seem to be progressing beyond that, maybe because they don't have that history of pattern matching that was once limiting. Great examples of this are Florida, Texas, and Georgia. And what we're seeing in these three states is that maybe the migration of entrepreneurs 
entrepreneurial excellence, the opportunities that have happened through liquidity, the capital environments, and these collaborations that are coming together are really driving new outcomes in a really inspiring way. Now, our hope is obviously we continue to collect all of this data and look at the lagging and leading indicators of what is actually going on behind states. There's no single data set right now that can tell us the whole story, but part of our revitalizing innovation uh, entrepreneurial report aims to try to bring together all of this collection so that we're no longer continually investing in the first mile of the innovation economy, but actually leapfrogging to the last mile where we can see radical growth for all. And again, if we think about what's possible through this landscape, what we think that's going to happen is that we see more stickiness and more opportunity for the benefit of all business owners in America. It is interesting. I mean, obviously, it's fascinating that Florida Texas and Georgia mm. are where you see the most progress in terms of equity. It just isn't something you'd expect from watching, you know, the mainstream media. Um, mm. But it's also, to me, uh, maybe more surprising that I don't see California here. You're normally in San Francisco. <laughs> I would expect San Franciscans to be a leader in this. Where's New York? You don't see New York. I know, I know, I know. You don't see no, New York no here either. <laughs> Why is that? Well, to be fair, what we wanted to say is we appreciate and, and understand deeply that the grassroots efforts of innovation has had this coastal opportunity. But it's not the only place anymore where innovation is happening in our great nation. And in fact, if anything, if we want to drive forward a greater blueprint, what we're seeing with our incredible collaborators from Penn State University is evidence to impact collaboration, looking at policy and the influence of policy across America, as well as Heartland Forward that's looked at the rise of all businesses in America. There's much more opportunity that's happening in middle America and spreading across to the outside areas. And we're also seeing that there's a regional strength that is emerging from these locations too. I mean, imagine seeing talent differently in these places and spaces that have just kind of not been on the top of everyone's minds. We aim to change that and really celebrate those incredible leaders and what they're doing. And I do appreciate that with this report, you're focusing on the positive aspects, yeah. of course, which states uh, score highly here. But I have to ask, who's at the bottom of the list? What states aren't necessarily a great place for these sorts of advancements? Well, maybe what I'll do is I'll flip it a little bit and say that there's a critical importance of sort of looking at a few key aspects to the methodology of how this report did. So number one, we wanted to actually normalize the data through Heartland Forward's great research and understand what is the percentage ratio of equity that's happening inside those states. That means how many businesses are actually being started by black, Hispanic, and women entrepreneurs. And then what is that percentage of the ratio overall of that representation and those identities within those states? And then finally, are they actually paying themselves above the average wage? Now, while I know that's a little bit not the typical conversation when it comes to entrepreneurial advancement and innovation, we know that for many with the lived experience, not paying themselves is not a possibility. So we need to start to understand and look at metrics differently than have historically emerged around this key topic. Well, Nicola, it's really interesting research. Really appreciate you taking the time to come and explain it to us. That, of course, is Nicola Corzine of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. Meanwhile, about an hour into the U.S. trading day, let's get a check on these markets. We'll do that with Abigail Doolittle. Well, after a four-week rally for stocks, Katie, we're looking at a modest loss for the S&P 500, down about three-tenths of one percent. Interesting is the fact that the VIX, that uncertainty gauge, it is back above a 20, telling you that investors are less complacent, whether it's hedging uh, against some possibility of a market fall or an outright bearish bet. It's unclear, but that is a, a healthy level there. New York crude oil at uh, nearly $76 prevail this, of course, uh, amid the tensions in the Middle East. And then the two-year yield, this is the big story of the day. Earlier, we had a brief inversion of the yield curve. The two-year yield had been back above uh, 4% right now, just flirting around that level, certainly putting some of the pressure on these risk assets and probably explaining why that VIX is higher. As for an event later this week, of course, we will have the big banks kicking off earnings season for Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and J.P. Morgan, or excuse me, for Wells Fargo and Bank of America, we're expected to see a gain in growth for revenue uh, for the fixed income side, uh, for equities, most of the banks, and then J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley Citigroup, and Goldman Sachs down. The big question here will be, how will the stocks react? And Chanel, you, of course, uh, know very well these stocks and the companies themselves. On the year, these bank stocks are higher, but off the high, so it's going to be very interesting to see how those third quarter results 
impact the trading activity of the big banks on the year? Abby, thank you so much. Let's take a look under the hood, shall we? Because you are watching the KBW Bank Index, guys. Katie, your point is well taken here that the S&P is not super heavily weighted to financials. But if you look at an index that is, it is tracking the S&P by and large. And every stock on the year has been in the green. Mm -hmm. Now, what is leading that? There the are... index in question is the KBW Index. It is, absolutely. Yes. Uh, what's interesting to me is actually... They're not all created equally. Bank of New York Mellon is up almost 40%, for example, while U.S. Bancorp is still up less than 3% on mm -hmm. the year. So if you think about that bid into regional banks, you haven't really seen it. It's been in the larger banks, Goldman, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, Bank of America, and even those larger regionals like PNC. Right. But also interesting here is, to your point also, Katie, it's financials outside of the banks. It's the world of well, Amex so here. That's the thing. If you take a look at the U.S. large cap financial sector, as I mentioned, that is 13 percent of the S&P 500. Great note from DataTrack this morning that banks are only 24 percent of the financial sector. We focus on the big banks and we tend to talk about the financials as a behemoth. But you have to be specific here when you're actually talking about the financials. When J.P. Morgan goes on Friday, it's credit quality that everyone's going to be looking at if they're any hints of danger there, then you will see that ripple effect throughout that financial sector, particularly in some of those weaker areas that there hasn't been that much pain, but could be if things start to turn. What's the trading pic picture going to look like? Because that's always most interesting to me. Goldman said they're off the highs here. And so remember, it was an amazing year. We've seen some of that volatility come back into the market. Goldman is commodity heavy. What does that look like at Citigroup, Wells Fargo, uh, the other banks that might be more credit heavy? Could be right. different. Well, J.P. Morgan, uh, going back to the chart that Abigail showed us, expected to have a great quarter when it comes to equity trading, uh, expected to see 20.7 percent growth there. It's interesting that overall it seems like equity trading growth is expected for these banks relative to FIC. FIC, of course, has been the bright spot, but the Comps are pretty tough. It's Wait a second. FIC is uh, income, financial. Sorry, fixed income currencies and commodities. Thank there you, you very much. But equities is all off of IPOs. Fresh equity insurance leads to more trading activity. And also, we've been talking about it that VIX, yes, it's after the quarter, but the VIX back at 21, the highest levels in a month. Some uncertainty, some volatility is good for these banks making money. Yeah, I just think it's always interesting because with, it, with uh, investment banking, we kind of know. Mm -hmm. Right. You just have to type M I go on your Bloomberg terminal and you can see yeah. where the deals are and who's doing them Great with trading. You don't know um, until you actually get the numbers. You don't know until you know. Now, coming up tomorrow, what we do know is there's an exclusive interview that Bloomberg is having with J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon at 930 a.m. Eastern. Stick with us for that. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for our daily Wall Street Week conversation. And once sought after, San Francisco has become a less desirable hub for businesses over the years. David Weston speaks with the CEO of Prologis about the current state of the city. Well, San Francisco was a very different place in 1983, but it was not all great. Um, I'll, I'll answer your question in a little while, but, uh, you know, we were just coming off of uh, the um, assassination of Mayor Moscone. Uh, Harvey Milk uh, and uh, the AIDS ep epidemic uh, was uh, was raging at that time. So um, we always remember the good old days, but there were certainly problems in those days as well. What was different um, uh, was that the San Francisco business community was much more engaged and committed to the city. Uh, you had some large companies like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chevron, PG&E, and the list goes on. Levi, of course, a San Francisco-based company. Uh, and uh, there were a couple of individuals who were really civic-minded leaders in, in the community, people like Warren Hellman, Chuck Schwab, uh, Walter Shorenstein, and Don Fisher. Uh, that really had were running significant businesses, but at the same time, we were really committed to San Francisco. They were philanthropic. They cared about what happened happened in the city, and then really because of the passage of time, uh, those companies either moved to the suburbs or they moved out of town, and over time they were replaced with uh, companies that were less committed to San Francisco, including a lot of tech companies in the last cycle social media companies, et cetera. So I think that corporate core 
if you will, uh, hollowed during this period of time, uh, and the commitment declined as a result of that. So I think that's the big difference. What did that mean for the city of San Francisco, to live in, to work in? Well, what it meant is that an important voice uh, driving the economy uh, was really uh, missing in the political dialogue. And uh, a lot of decisions that were made um, were made in the context of the popularity of San Francisco. Everybody was trying to break down the door to get in here. And San Francisco perfected the art of saying no. And uh, they could get away with it when, when there was so much demand for coming in here. And then, of course, COVID um, uh, exposed the chinks in the armor. And, uh, and during the same time, taxes went up in San Francisco significantly. The cost of housing and other costs of living increased significantly. And all, all of these became um, barriers uh, to business thriving in San Francisco. Uh, so a lot of uh, companies actually moved out. It, it accelerated uh, the move out of San Francisco. We had a gross receipts tax here in the city that was very anti-business. But slowly but surely, uh, we drove business out of the city, and that uh, that aspect or that voice is missing in the dialogue today. And that was the CEO of Pro Lodges speaking to David Weston. And of course, you can catch Wall Street Week every Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. This is Bloomberg. Boeing and its largest union are at the negotiating table after two weeks of a stalemate. Each day of the manufacturing strike cost the plane maker an estimated $100 million in lost sales. Let's discuss with Sid Phillip, Bloomberg's deputy editor for Global Aviation. So, Sid, they've been on strike for a while. Uh, how much longer do you think this is going to last? Uh, that's anybody's guess. I mean, both sides are hoping to get a negotiation and get a deal done because for Boeing, this is costing them an estimated 100 million a day. The workers have lost, the 33,000 workers, they lost their health care benefits last week. And the strike's been going on for now it's in its fourth week. And so production's been stalled essentially for Boeing. And that means the company isn't being able to get any cash into the door because without deliveries of planes, they can't really get cash and they need to start building planes and delivering them again to get out of the hole that Boeing currently faces. Well, Sid, it's amazing that the strike is still going on. A fourth week of strikes here. I feel like the union maybe... Wait, may I thought be... this was the third week. We just said they've been in strike for two weeks. And... Well, I thought they were entering the fourth week. Oh, are we? Yeah, so this is the... They're entering the fourth week. Yeah. We finished then the I third week. In and the intro. And well, good the... thing we're correcting no. it right now. Sid, go on, please. No, so I was going to say that essentially the last time they had discussions was at the end of September. So essentially there's a lot of things happening at the moment, but there's also quite a bit not happening for Boeing. And they would be in a position where they'd rather have the strike end and get production back, uh, back up again. And so that's where Boeing finds itself. I mean, there's still a big gap between what the union wants, which is a return to a, a pension, a sort of funded pension plan, and the company sort of hasn't really accepted that and there's also a gap between how much they want the unions asked for 40 percent the company they put out a unsolicited offer which angered the union for 30 percent and so there's still some things to hash out before they can actually get a deal and get production back again right well Sid, what i wanted to ask you though is when it comes to the unions i have to imagine they feel like they have leverage here you think about the dire straits financially that boeing is in and then you think about the recent wins that unions across industries have had and i'm speaking specifically about the ports here again have to imagine that boeing's union is feeling a little bit emboldened absolutely i mean and and the position that they're in is that they felt compelled to accept previous offers because at that time there was uh, the threat of production moving out of the Seattle area. And so this time the union sort of is bent on sort of making sure that they can get what the best deal that they can. And given the fact that Boeing's in a really tough spot at the moment and they've got production hamstrung by both the FAA investigating poor production quality, they've got 
Um, they've had the whole door blowout and that sort of led to a lot of scrutiny on Boeing. Uh, they've got a whole bunch of issues, and they've, including getting a brand new CEO who is just weeks into the job and he's having to deal with this new thing. So essentially, it's, they're in a bad position and the workers are sort of poised to get the best deal that they can. I just want to note that we are showing live pictures here of a SpaceX launch. Now, as I understand it, this is um, the European Space Agency's HERA mission. It's going to visit an asteroid that NASA knocked off course from Earth in 2022, so kind of like an Armageddon-style thing. Um, HERA will assess the aftermath of that impact, but there are no people on this rocket. So um, I guess, is it, is it less important, Sid? Are you following this, this mission? We are following it, I mean, but this will actually reach the asteroid only in 2026. So it's still some time away in terms of actually being able to study. This is sort of a crime scene investigation of the previous NASA mission is what they termed it as. And they're sort of looking to see what the impact of that previous mission was, including the size of the crater, the size of the asteroid deflection and, and essentially the aftermath of the asteroid that NASA deflected in 2022. So we're still going to have to wait a bit for the uh, details on that investigation. Potentially, hopefully by then the Boeing strike will be over. But yeah. All right, Sid, great to have you on the program. Sid Phillip there covers global aviation for us and uh, that includes and rockets. That includes rockets, yes. Yeah. Um, but Boeing, I think, is mainly the story that I, I know that each one of you had a story that you're really focused on this morning, and Shanali's was the bank's right. earnings on Friday. Uh, you're, I mean, you're focused on this American icon. We're all it's focused amazing. on it together. Well, How do you not be? To go back to Boeing, I mean, it's just been uh, striking to watch Boeing have such a bad year, watch Intel have striking. such a bad year. These are two American icons, of course, decades old companies, and boy, 2024 has not been kind. Right. The main difference that I note is Intel could fail. Yeah. Boeing can Boeing, have a, a bad mean, year. I mean, it doesn't matter. They're all too right? big to fail. We need this company to survive. The U.S. And, government would agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the question is, what <laughs> happens with Boeing? I mean, how much, uh, you know, how much impetus do they really have to make a deal? Because yeah. they know that they're not going to fail. Whereas Intel, they need to do but it's something. it's costly. Right? It's costly in the time being. That's yeah, right. $100 million a day, apparently. I will say with Boeing, we, were, of course, are showing the SpaceX rocket, or we were. Uh, this is a different story than what we're talking about with Boeing. But Boeing's space program burning billions and billions of dollars. And then you have upstarts such as SpaceX just eating their lunch. Think about the astronauts stranded in space from a Boeing mission and now SpaceX is going to rescue them and save the day. Some serious Cold War vibes going on here with Elon Musk uh, campaigning over the weekend as well. So the more SpaceX grows, the more his influence does as well. Well, and if you frame it that way, it really begs the question, is Boeing too big to fail? I mean, if SpaceX can fulfill... Maybe not in the space category. All the duties that... Well, if a private company can do much better, yeah. then, you know, I guess it's a state supported company. Are you happy you we say. talked about Boeing tonight? Yes, I am. There we go. All right. Quickly check on markets here, of course, to bring it back to the public equity markets. As we know, it has been a rough start to the trading week. Still rough right now, currently down across the major indexes as bonds continue to sell off. Now, coming up this week on Open Interest, we have a loaded week in the C-Street from Cameco to Priceline. You won't want to miss it. This is Bloomberg.